welcome to all of you. Welcome from wherever in the world you are joining. Uh, the quick introduction of uh, Wendy Nicklin. So Wendy is uh, a nurse. She's got her bachelor's and master's in nursing. Uh, she's uh, uh, been head of the Australian uh, accreditation ecosystem. Uh, so has uh, got to the highest point of the national ecosystem in her region. And then from there has uh, taken it to further heights as a former president of ISQUA. She's also one of the ISQUA's experts. So uh, strongly recognized in the field, has been deeply involved in the patient for safety, patient safety movement in Canada, which is something that's uh, picked up a lot of momentum in recent years. Uh, sits on the boards of a number of different institutions, including the Carlton Hospital and uh, a hospice and other ecosystems. Uh, a person who likes playing golf, so if you uh, have a good handicap, you could perhaps take her on. Uh, and more importantly, uh, somebody who I think is going to educate us deeply in terms of uh, what the implications of leadership around quality and safety means in healthcare. But more importantly, perhaps what uh, more recent times during COVID, some of the challenges to us as leaders uh, or folks who are deeply impacted by the uh, realities of today and the team members in which we uh, look after the welfare, what does it mean for them? So I think with that, uh, we're going to allow uh, Wendy to have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for the warm welcome. And it is an honor to uh, be joining you today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Wendy Nicklin, and I'm giving this talk from my home that's located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, which is the capital of Canada. It's my honor to spend the next 45 minutes with you, or hour with you, and I look forward to allowing time for questions at the end. As I developed this talk titled Leadership and Quality and Safety, I started by reviewing many previous talks that I've given over many years to determine what to focus on and where the focus needed to be adjusted to reflect today's reality. It became clear to me today's reality is vastly different than it was 10 years ago, vastly different than five years ago, in fact, vastly different than three years ago. The highlights of this presentation include the perfect storm, the challenges placed on healthcare leaders, effective leadership, the current state of risk and safety impacting quality of care, culture and leadership style, and the gaps and wounds of the healthcare system that's been exposed in all of our countries and rising to the challenge. The perfect storm picture, over the past two and a half years, we have all personally and professionally experienced an unbelievable perfect storm in which many stressors have collided head on. We have all been in the same storm, although perhaps we are in different boats. What has made the past two and a half years the perfect storm and the perfect storm for healthcare leaders? The pandemic which loomed before us in March 2020 and even began months before that has changed our world like never before. None of us were protected from the domino impact of the coronavirus. Our healthcare system was impacted in ways we could not have forecast. While many countries had a disaster plan in place should a major pandemic occur, it soon became evident that those disaster plans were either outdated or ineffective, underestimating the tremendous impact on all aspects of everyday life. Who would have predicted the impact on the supply chain, the impact on production, impacting every industry, such as healthcare, education, technology, banking, travel and transportation, and so on. Then as many businesses move to remote or virtual work if possible, there was an immense impact on our social reality. Previously having friends and colleagues nearby to share joys, sorrows and problems, we were all isolated in one degree or another. Children were at home being virtually schooled, a new way of learning to which some adapted and some did not. Parents were juggling virtual work as well as endeavoring 
to assist their children with virtual learning. Those working in healthcare, the majority of us, continued going to work, your place of employment to provide healthcare, for all the stresses of wearing PPE and caring for parents with patients with COVID, placing themselves at risk while worrying about children at home and schooling. Now, as scientists work to predict how the patterns of the virus would evolve, when the next surge might occur, when the wave might diminish, then the timing of the next wave related to the variant, governments made decisions to reduce elective surgery in hospitals and other healthcare organizations in order to prepare for the potential surge affected by the virus affecting hospitalization and possibly ICU care. The rapid pivot to virtual healthcare occurred overnight. While for several decades, there had been a slow increase in providing virtual healthcare, the pandemic skyrocketed this change, yet without the appropriate checks and balances in place. When was virtual care appropriate and when not? The slowdown, in fact, the stoppage of elective healthcare activity, surgical procedures and so on, for an undetermined period of time meant that waiting lists grew. The postponement of a surgical procedure could result in the patient's medical condition worsening. Clearly, there has been and continues to be impact of delayed diagnosis and treatment. And since then, what is the impact on the longer term health of the individual and health of the population? Staff experienced increased workload and demands to work overtime. The combination of stress at work and at home resulted in burnout and exhaustion of many of our colleagues and perhaps of you. In addition, I want to just share a headline from a newspaper in my own city of Ottawa. And this headline is from June 20th of 2022. So this is 24 months, more than 24 months after the onset of COVID. And here was the headline, hospital ORs running under capacity backlogs, wait times, part of a growing healthcare crisis. As I say, note that this headline is very recent and I suspect that your country and region has a similar story. So the impacts of the COVID and the pandemic have continued. Now let's talk about some of the rapid changes we experienced. Many rapid change, changes or pivots, as some may say, were necessary in the moment. We took risks that innovation and change, yet without thoughtful analysis and an implementation strategy, which may have been carried out if time had been permitted. At the August 9th, 2022 WHO webinar titled Implication of the COVID-19 Pandemic for Patient Safety, a rapid review, Dr. Neela Mingrat noted that the pandemic exposed existing weaknesses in the health systems, has diminished the capacity of our healthcare systems, and has a, had a substantial impact on patient safety. She notes the impact of misinformation is a global phenomena. When I think of misinformation, I think of those who are anti-vaxxers, and I suspect in your own country, you had a number of citizens who were anti-vaxxers who did not support the requirement for the COVID vaccine and had concerns about its potential impact on health. The following cartoon depicts how a journalist in Canada views anti-vaxxers as similar to those who may not believe in using a, par a parachute. I think this perhaps is a good analogy so you can see, here's someone who's anti-parachute and the person who's coming down smoothly in his parachute says he's going to the anti-parachute rally. And perhaps I think those who chose not to get vaccinated were perhaps entering into a bit of a risky situation as well. Now we are in a situation of evaluation through the rear or side view mirror of healthcare. And we're going to move to the second element of our crisis, and that is the health human resource crisis. 
Added to this pandemic reality has been the predicted health human resource shortage worldwide. And I emphasize that word predicted. We knew a shortage was occurring, would be in front of us, and we knew we would be countering it. That was even without a pandemic, we knew there would be a shortage. This was predicted many years ago, given the anticipated retirement of what we call in North America baby boomers, coupled with a declining birth rate in many countries. However, we did not anticipate that the pandemic would be with us and escalate burnout and dissatisfaction amongst healthcare workers, nurses, physicians, and others, such that exits from the profession were worsened by factors that led to early retirements, those choosing to leave the healthcare profession entirely. Thus, we are experiencing massive shortages of healthcare workers, further worsening the shortage, stress, and burnout within, health, within the healthcare environment. None of us were spared from the stress. We have, in, we have shared joys, we have shared sorrows, we have shared learnings, and supported each other. All as I said, we are in the same storm, but we are in different boats. Here's another headline from a, a newspaper in Canada, re referencing the health human resource crisis from July of this year, two months ago, which stated Hamilton hospitals down 678 employees amid record high healthcare worker shortages. And I expect we could share similar stories. So leading since the onset of COVID, for two and a half years now, we've been leading through this unrelenting sustained crisis. Our leadership ground has shifted. Most leaders, if you find a minute to interconnect, agree we have had similar challenges and priorities. The focus has often been how to get through the next day, the next week, or the next month. How long will the stressful reality continue without a glimmer of hope and promise? The stresses have been unrelenting. I want now to shift gears and take a moment to recognize that there have been some positive changes and advances that have arisen during the pandemic. A comprehensive list of these is included in the WHO release titled Implications of the COVID-19 Pandemic for Patient Safety. Dr. Neelam Ningren identified positive impacts on patient safety, such as within the leadership and culture area. Silos broke down with widespread sharing of clinical information and best practices. There was standardization like never before and rapid development of evidence. Regarding vaccine diagnostics and therapeutics, we experienced rapid development of vaccines. Several novel vaccine platforms were rapidly developed and deployed. In the area of service delivery transformations, we saw rapid progress in the development of innovative crisis management programs, development of checklists, new clinical protocols, new COVID-10 healthcare facilities, non-COVID patient areas, field hospitals and equipment installations sprang up at rapid speed. The public awareness of overall health and safe care and digital literacy increased. Awareness of mental health and the importance of caring for health workers um, increased. The health worker safety focus is now improving. Industrial developments included, um, such as increasing production of existing items. Many startup companies originated to help supply essential items to hospitals. The spread of inv innovations was often rapid. There were digital transformations and innovations, novel at home diagnostic tools and strategies, use of predictive models and initiatives and so on. Finally, the overall approach to managing the pandemic in some countries, there was better control at the national or regional level influenced by factors such as rapid science-based risk assessment with early and decisive government action. So these were positive transformative changes that have influenced our healthcare. And now we've set the stage, let's talk about leadership. 
First of all, when I talk about leadership, it's important to frame this to note that we are all leaders at one time or another. Some of you may be the CEO of a healthcare organization, whether acute care, long-term care, home care, rehab, mental health. Some of you may be directors or managers of a program within some of these organizations, or you may work within government in a department of health. You may be on a specific ward or clinic or community. You may be team leader or coordinator. Leaders exist throughout healthcare. And while roles and titles may vary, our priorities have similarities, although vary in degree. Remember the power of our message and our potential to influence behaviors and practices. When we become upset with something that other leaders are saying or doing, remember to look in the mirror. Are you, are we effective role models? What is our responsibility when the system is in crisis? Now let's talk about effective leadership. What is effective leadership? Effective leadership is essential to enable and ensure the provision of quality healthcare for improved outcomes, for population health, for the attainment of high organizational and or system performance. If healthcare leadership weakens for whatever reason, the impacts are significant. Some of the impacts may be evident within the short term, others may not be evident for years. However, suffice it to say, Weak leadership will impact culture, performance, and outcome. Leading through this perfect storm has presented a challenge for current healthcare leaders, which few have ever encountered before. The stress within the healthcare environment, the stress within one's personal life, the stress being experienced by everyone around us set the stage for our biggest leadership challenge of the past 50 years. Our ground has shifted and we will not be the same as before. That being said, effective leadership for healthcare quality and safety is essential to bring stability and hope as we ride the tidal wave of this sustained crisis. Since this talk is about leadership for quality and safety, I will briefly highlight that when I speak about quality of care, I'm speaking about the multitude of dimensions which comprise quality that need to be addressed for quality here to be prov provided and to pervade. There are eight dimensions of quality within the framework of Accreditation Canada's accreditation program. And you can see those here. The IHI addresses similar dimensions. They are safety, quality, client-centered, work-life, efficiency, appropriateness, accountability, population focus, and community. All dimensions must be addressed for quality care to be provided. If care is unsafe, quality care is not present. If quality care for the healthcare provider is, or if quality work life for the healthcare provider is not addressed, then quality care will be negatively impacted. Be careful. Don't go down the rabbit hole of focusing on just one dimension of quality and believe that that will result in safe quality care because it won't. You must have a balanced view of all of those dimensions of quality. Here's the Institute of Medicine's dimensions of quality or they call them attributes of a quality healthcare system. They say the elements are safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient and equitable. All dimensions or attributes must be considered in balance. And now I have a question for you and I'll ask um, the team supporting my presentation to conduct a poll. And this is the question that will be posed to you. Compared to 2018, do you believe that the quality of health care in your country today, is it A better? Is the quality of healthcare the same compared to 2018, or is it worse? Very interesting. So they're showing 79% are saying it's better, 14% are saying it's the same, and 7% are saying worse. 
Okay, that's very interesting. So please put in your answer and then we'll ask for the results to be provided to us. Okay, we'll close the close the poll now. Who will have the results? Is that you, Samir? Or? They're on the screen. Very interesting. So they're showing 79% are saying it's better, 14% are saying it's the same, and 7% are saying worse. Okay, that's very interesting. The, um, the overall, uh, I'll take that off now. Thank you very much for that. The overall impact um, throughout North America and the developed countries is actually indicating that um, quality of care has declined or is declining because of the backups of waiting lists, the delayed diagnostics and therapeutics, um, the burnout, uh, the stress, and that there are signs of declining quality of care. Um, and some of the factors being identified, I suggest to you, are that the healthcare system is under significant stress and is still recovering from the impacts of the pandemic. And there are negative impacts of virtual care, such that some diagnoses are inaccurate or delayed. And there's delays as well in routine colonoscopies, mammograms, and in many countries, these continue to be delayed. Surgery has been delayed. Hospitals are now attempting to catch up on delayed procedures. Then you layer on top of that the health human resource crisis, the predicted crisis, as I mentioned, the staff shortages, an increasing use of unskilled workers, and then layer on top of that the burnout that everyone is feeling, including perhaps some of you. Staff are working extra overtime shifts or extra hard due to a colleague being absent resulting in workload impacts. Physicians are also saying they're personally stressed and dealing with this new reality, endeavoring to provide quality care in some virtual environments and maintain effective communication with their patients, yet not seeing them personally in many cases and realizing they are stretched beyond their limits. In my own country, it's ext extremely difficult to find a family physician. Family physicians who retire or retire early are unable to find a new family physician who will take over their practice. Yet those patients assigned with the retiring physician are now without the family physician. This slide depicts how the media portrays the healthcare system at this time. And this is a cartoon which you can see, which was in a newspaper here in Canada, a national newspaper. And the leader of the province is saying, ordering all hands on deck as a healthcare ship sinks. Cartoons like this were never in the media before, but there is a perception by the public that healthcare system is, um, is sinking. So I will be interested during the Q&A and discussion period, your thoughts on this. I would suggest to you that there's also escalating risks within the healthcare environment for errors or omissions to occur. The healthcare environment, wherever it is, is such that the potential for an adverse event, a preventable adverse event, is higher than it was pre-pandemic. Further, with escalating risk in the healthcare environment, the risk is elevated for both patients and staff, for those who work in that environment. As leaders, we're challenged to lead a workforce, to nurture a culture, and a culture that enables the provision of quality care in an environment safe for our patients and families and safe for our workers, volunteers, and the public. This leads me to talk about culture. One of your main roles as a leader is to set the organization culture or the unit culture and contribute to building and sustaining this culture. So let's talk about the culture of quality and safety and what are the elements? First of all, it is person-centered. 
focusing on the care provider, care recipient, all those in the healthcare environment. There's trust, respect, caring and warmth. It is psychologically safe. It is an environment that values transparency and no blame. It's a learning environment. There is a quality focus in everything. There is a learning uh, focus. The quality focus is embedded in everything that we do. Outcome focus I've mentioned. Innovation and risk-taking are encouraged and we can see through the impact of COVID that we saw more and more of that. There is strong leadership and you will notice effective and high performing teams. And finally, a focus on measurement and monitoring systems to enable improvement. <coughs> Pardon me, now this is the ideal, correct? This is what we're all striving for and working for within our healthcare environments, whether within your country, your region or your organization. Think about these elements. Given the perfect storm within which we are working, are these elements of the culture of quality in existence in your organization? Which of these elements has been de-emphasized or declined during the pandemic? Which of the elements requires rebuilding? The absence of deterioration of this culture, the absence or deterioration, pardon me, means that this may be an organization within what may not be an organization within which one wants to work or is one within which there is stress. And I want to share with you a very significant occurrence in the United States regarding a nurse who administered an incorrect medication that led to a patient's death in 2017 and who was sentenced this year in 2022. The facts are noted on the following slide, and I'm not sure what degree of international coverage this got, but it had extensive coverage throughout North America. So this is a summary of that case. The headline is nurse guilty of criminally negligent homicide and gross neglect. So this nurse's name has been in the public. Nurse Vaught of the Vanderbilt University Medical Center was caring for a 75 year old patient about to undergo a PET scan in 2017. She accidentally administered Verconium, a neuromuscular blocker agent, instead of Versed to treat anxiety. The nurse quickly admitted to making a mistake. When the instant review was undertaken, the contributing system factors were also identified. That being said, the nurse was criminally charged with negligent homicide this year. In a recent article, authors Curry and Richards stated, the quote is on this slide, criminalizing unintentional medical mistakes perpetuates an unrealistic and dangerous standard of perfection in healthcare. That those who make mistakes are incompetent and must be shown the door. The goal should be to adjust the safety standard and practices to mitigate future risk. And if you truly look at this case, it is an example of a Swiss cheese situation. And yet the nurse ended up being charged as criminally negligent. So as a leader, are you reviewing your culture now? As you reflect on the outcome to a medical error, what elements of the culture quality are negatively impacted? In my humble opinion, this situation has set patient safety back several decades. Will healthcare workers feel comfortable reporting near misses or adverse events or errors if there may be criminal charges? What are the system responsibilities and contributing factors? Thus, when you look at your culture, what elements must be rebuilt? And yes, while everyone is under stress, where do you start? We are all challenged. So let's switch gears and talk about style of leadership. And we'll briefly speak about this. I'm sure each one of you can describe your preferred personal style. Are you a consensus builder, a leader who's analytical? Do you take time to listen to all input and involve appropriate stakeholders? Are you a strong communicator, an open door policy? In an article titled Reflections in a Time of Crisis, What It Takes to Manage and Lead Integrated Healthcare, 
The author suggests that during the pandemic, and I think this is a very important point, during the pandemic, we experienced rapid deployment of technology and innovations, massive shifts in work and workspaces, and significantly truncated styles for adopting change. They go on to say we witnessed a regression in leadership approaches, stepping back to more traditional command and control styles of leadership and management, which is more familiar and safer. And I would add more appropriate in those situations during times of uncertainty and when rapid decision-making is required. Look in the mirror. I expect you have noticed that your leadership style shifted over the past two and a half years. That being said, as the health environment slowly stabilizes, albeit still within the reality of a chronic crisis, perhaps you may be able to regain or increasingly revert back to your previous style. The Institute of Healthcare Improvement in the US released a white paper in 2013, which is still very relevant. And it's titled, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, High Impact Leadership, Improve Care, Improve the Health of Populations and Reduce Costs. They identify five critical behaviors uh, leading to achieving the triple aim results. Person-centeredness, consistently person-centered in word and deed, engaging patients and community members uh, in planning and improvement activities, start each meeting with a patient story, frontline engagement, be a regular authentic presence at the front line and a visible champion of improvement, a relentless focus on vision and strategy, transparency, transparency about results, process, aims, and boundaries. And finally, boundarylessness, encourage and practice systems thinking and collaboration across boundaries. Now, I would suggest that all of us should examine our own leadership style. Look in the mirror. Effective leadership is essential for the provision of quality care, for improved outcomes, and for high organizational performance and health system performance. Are you person-centered? Would those with whom you work say you are person-centered and based on what? Do you engage the front line? Are you focused on vision and strategy? The crisis of the past two and a half years led us to focus on the crisis of the moment and thinking ahead five years has not necessarily been a priority. Do you embrace transparency? Do you recognize transparency? Recognizing that criminal case in the US when the nurse came forward, how is that impacting your staff and your comfort to come forward and identify errors or near misses? And do you encourage thinking and actions across boundaries? Thankfully, the pandemic leapfrogged this way of thinking in many countries, working with our partners across the health system and across industries and across countries became an imperative, not an option. Working across the health system became necessary for sustainability and for leading and managing during the pandemic. We must not lose this important achievement we have all experienced and we value. The pandemic has also served to expose the gaps and wounds in our healthcare systems. New problems have arisen. The predicted health human resource shortage as anticipated is there and how the unbelievable stress of working within the system has added almost unbearable stress, stress to everyone while working. Improvements are required in all of our health systems. Some systems need to be rebuilt, others need to be remodeled or renovated, just like your home. However, clearly our current systems are not sustainable and the negative impacts on quality of care related to system deficiencies and inadequate resources are having dramatic impacts on outcomes. Outcomes to patients, population, and organizational performance. Change is needed now. That, will be a, that can be a topic for another presentation. In conclusion, leadership in quality and safety, leaders responsible for quality and safety are challenged like never before. The perfect storm, 
the escalating risk within our healthcare systems, the burnout experienced by those working within the system, the shortage of healthcare providers, and the burnout experienced by those working within the system, the stresses at home present a challenge to healthcare leaders. How should we effectively lead today considering this challenge? How do you effectively lead today? Remember that quality of care has been impacted and there is some escalating risk in the healthcare environment. Risk is higher for both patients and staff. The standard of care has been, has been dropped, at least certainly in the developed countries. How do we ensure that this standard of care, if it has decreased, does not become an accepted norm? That we become numb to the standard to which we must aim. Remember, we are leading within a post-pandemic PTSD reality. And if you Google PTSD post-pandemic, you will see that some researchers are identifying uh, that many have, been, uh, have PTSD symptoms related to the pandemic. As a leader, what does this mean to your approach to leadership for quality and safety? How must you change and adapt? I propose some guidance to you. We are challenged to examine your organization's culture. Has it deteriorated? Has it remained solid? Has it progressed? How do you know? What do you monitor to determine the health of your organization's culture? Are your KPIs sufficiently sensitive to identify changes in culture, changes in performance, changes in outcomes? Examine your leadership style. Retain the benefits of the change experienced during the pandemic, encouraging innovation and risk, working across sectors. And please don't re-erect re those silos that we had for many, many years. Don't put a lid on innovation, yet take time to evaluate some of the rapid changes. We are challenged to examine our own leadership style. Have you retained some of the characteristics you employed during the pandemic and the waves of that crisis? Have you ensured engagement or re-engagement of the front line in a participatory style? And finally, I'm referencing back to a slide you saw earlier in this presentation. I will not read through it, but remember these transformative changes which did occur. And how can we contribute to ensuring that these remain in place and are further strengthened? How can we work on and evaluate the accelerated move to virtual healthcare and some other benefits? So again, build on these strengths as you repair and rebuild. Finally, take care of yourself. We have a personal accountability. What is the state of your own mental health? Again, look in the mirror. How are you coping? Leaders are generally proud people. Admitting we are stressed or vulnerable is not easy. But remember, we're all human. Take time to personally decompress. What strategies do you utilize to relax and distract yourself? Admit when or if you need additional support. If you are stressed, likely you are less sensitive to the stress of others. We are all stressed. Sometimes we'll just say, oh, we're all stressed. Get on with your work. But that's not good enough. If you care for yourself, you are better able to care for others. And also try to keep your sense of humor. Remember how we effectively lead for today is not how we effectively lead for tomorrow. Leaders must adapt their approach, styles and behaviors to the context, stresses and team strengths. In conclusion, leadership throughout the pandemic has been a challenge for everyone. Be sensitive and supportive to those with whom we work. Take time to share concerns and successes. Effective leadership during this sustained chronic crisis, the perfect storm, has presented all of us with opportunities. Opportunities to grow, to improve our organization, to care, and to try new practices. Seize these opportunities and continue leading for quality and safety. In summary, I've reviewed, as you can see, the perfect storm, talked about our challenges, effective leadership, current state of risk and safety, 
We talked a bit about culture and the elements of culture, reflecting on leadership style, that the gaps and wounds of the healthcare system have been exposed and to ensure that we all collectively must rise to the challenge. So thank you very much. I look forward to any comments or questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, we've got, uh, uh, I'm sure there's some, some of the audience have a couple of questions coming in, but let me start with a perhaps general one. Uh, we uh, have been trained, I guess, in most management ecosystems to focus on systems leadership, uh, that when you put systems in place, uh, they tend to hold well. Uh, the challenge is, of course, most of the systems probably never were tested to a perfect storm or at least an eventuality what COVID uh, was experienced in different parts of the world where it's uh, a globalized world, hyper-connected, where you had a, a disease and a virus that basically spread because of our connectedness rather than our disconnectedness of the system. Uh, so we had a system that effectively worked against us. Uh, you're focusing a lot more on people-centered leadership, which tends to work in a hyper-local setting, but much tougher to scale to different parts of the world, especially when you're uh, not in the same room, when you're having to do it with Zoom, when you're having to do it through virtual uh, team ecosystems. Is there a big trade-off between systems and people-centered in your opinion? Uh, no, I don't think so at all. I mean, I think if we, are in government or focusing in a, from a, looking at the system as a whole, we have to show we're sensitive to what those within the system are experiencing. So when you give a dialogue, when you create policy, when you, um, you know, are reaching out to get feedback on items, are you sensitive to what those within your population are experiencing because the systems at a local level permeate the population. And what does that mean to being sensitive to what the population is experiencing? So I think they're unbelievably compatible. And I think those who are in uh, perhaps more system and policy situations um, themselves need to be mutually supportive and need to reflect that they understand the reality. I mean, if, if at a system level, we become insensitive to what that person-centeredness means, then I think we could find ourselves a bit irrelevant. So I think it's really important to, can, you can still be client-centered within that system's perspective and a person-centered. Um, whether it's the healthcare workers, whether you lead a professional organization of physicians, whether you're leading other professional organizations related to diagnostic imaging or whatever, uh, that sensitivity, I think, must be there. And I think that's where leaders need to look in the mirror. I mean, would people say you care? Would they say you understand the reality? So I would say, in, in a sense, they're compatible. I think it's really important to demonstrate sensitivity and uh, recognizing the reality of uh, what it's like to um, be within healthcare at whatever level. No, I, I think uh, the other observation I had when you were talking is, especially when you talked about the quality and culture uh, leadership and the ingredients that mattered, uh, a lot of them looked like the same ingredients for high-performing teams. Absolutely. Uh, right? And uh, Absolutely. I think uh, healthcare is... Uh, basically a domain that's made for teams uh, and yet with a highly heterogeneous population of doctors with nurses with housekeeping staff that especially in most developing parts of the world perhaps don't have anywhere near the education level but perhaps much more touch on the ground and therefore Absolutely. impact potentially uh, so I think those are examples of uh, I, I think high performing teams which is not a very well studied or understood subject here so I think let's jump to some of the audience questions. Uh, first one by Naresh Gol, which is, uh, he'd like to understand why people in India, I suspect, feel that systems have improved while it's different in many other places. That's, that's a very good question. I think you would have to tell me that. Um, <laughs> there's no question throughout North America and many of the developed countries, the um, I mean, we have, I mean, there's been the transformative changes that are identified in that WHO uh, document and webinar, which are all the positive pieces of the transformative changes that were 
um, precipitated to speed up during the pandemic. So those are all good things. Where the negative is being felt is in the fact elective surgeries were canceled. Um, there's backlog of cases. There's delays in mammograms and colonoscopies. We found that patients, the public did not go to emergency or seek medical attention um, because they were told the system was overloaded. So they delayed seeking care. And I suspect in about five years, we're going to see some negative population outcomes mm. that will we might be able to trace back to some of the delays, deferrals that have occurred during the pandemic. I mean, in North America now, uh, there's still work going on to try and catch up and restart. Um, so there's significant delays that have occurred in receiving care. So we have the positive impacts where, you know, people are working better in systems, that there's, there's less silos, we're sharing knowledge better. There's been some transformative changes, but at the same time, there has been this uh, incredible delay. So, but perhaps you can tell me, um, maybe India needs to set the mark or set the bar for us. No, I, I think the Naresh's insight as well as the poll is pretty much true and fair. Uh, I've spoken to leaders in the NHS as well as uh, in many health systems like the United States. Uh, and my sense is clearly uh, the expectation to reality was not met. Uh, I think people expected first world care uh, on their doorstep instant on, and that clearly wasn't met. Uh, and what we saw in India was a very different reality where I think we have 80,000 hospitals in different forms in India. And I would argue the majority of them actually stepped up and did, did work to the best of their capability. Where yeah, we so had challenges was perhaps uh, in India, and we saw that during wave two especially, is the supply chain, the connectedness, sometimes the support of the government. Uh, those were challenges. I mean, oxygen in certain parts of the country. I think we all saw those horrifying pictures uh, at parts of the peak. Uh, medicine availability. Uh, I think those tended to be very different. We actually saw a lot of doctors and nurses step up uh, and allied health workers and administrators, and I, I would argue citizens in general, really step up uh, to try their best uh, in a system that we knew was not perfect and nowhere near perfect, but at least uh, it had tried hard. And that's my sense of India. I've also heard similar stories from parts of Africa. I think Africa had a very different set of challenges. Uh, information asymmetry was very real in parts of Africa. Uh, the expectation of the West being able to help them uh, in many parts didn't materialize because the West was probably suffering from their own challenges. Uh, but in India, I think uh, the vaccine drive was phenomenal. I think uh, we now have an excess of vaccines in most regions. Uh, there are some pockets that are still struggling, but we we probably have, uh, I, I think, the, uh, the anti-vax uh, group was probably there, but hopefully we've educated a majority of them. What we found, though, is uh, how villages dealt with the pandemic was very different to cities. Uh, and that's something that the AHPI and CAHO teams did really well uh, to kind of like administer. But I mean, Naresh, you can answer it for yourself. Most people in India and most practitioners in health probably worked really hard. Uh, I have experience of many of my top doctors and nurses in my hospitals working extremely hard. Uh, we had people like Jai Lakshmi uh, uh, and many others, Satwana, they're here, Vidya, uh, Shobna, all worked extremely hard connecting people to make them successful. Our Lalu was on 24-7 uh, work alert and so were Anuradha and many of the leaders in Kaho. So I think... Uh, I would argue that India did well. We could do a lot better. Let's be transparent. Our supply chain was nowhere near as robust. I think the government uh, needs to ex increase their spend in healthcare. And that's clearly something that uh, is an expectation going forward. Uh, the digital connectivity is expected. And I think I'll come back to a question on digital connectedness because we're seeing regression there a bit, Wendy. We're seeing people who kind of like jumped up and implemented a lot of the latest tools. Then COVID disappeared. And in the last year, 
their focus on digital has diminished dramatically. We have seen mm -hmm. telemedicine basically uh, grow up like no yesterday exponentially or geometrically scaling and then fall off a cliff a little bit uh, in terms of just the numbers because people want to see their doctors again. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But I have another question from an anonymous person. In Kaho, we, we very rarely get anonymous people. So uh, I guess it's probably somebody who doesn't want to be known clearly, uh, which is, uh, is centralization better versus decentralization? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a very big question. Um, I think it depends on the context, on the issue, on the problem. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about a health system, I mean, Canada is an experiment itself. Um, Canada is one country. We actually have about 14 different health systems. Uh, because health, uh, maybe similar to you in India, health is a provincial responsibility. And we have 10 provinces, we have three territories, and then we have some, some pieces that are nationally uh, within a system. Um, so we have a number of different systems. And I think the one thing that became very evident during uh, the pandemic was that we actually needed to share information more effectively. We needed to try and sort of centralize some expertise, be able to get messages out and work more. And that word boundarylessness that, uh, that you saw in one of the slides, I mean, we had to work to do that. On the other hand, depending on the issue to be relevant, you've got to deal with your local context because there's different factors, different characteristics. So. I think that question is very, very broad. Um, I think depending on what's behind the question and what some of the issues are, um, it might be easier to answer that. But I think there's an argument both ways. For decentralized, you can perhaps respond faster. You can be more relevant to your population. You can understand the idiosyncrasies of what you're dealing with. Centralized allows perhaps better sharing, allows um, you know, getting knowledge across um, perhaps minimizes duplication if you've been able to find an approach that should be across a country or across a, a state or province. Um, I mean, if we talk about the latest experiences more, they call it uh, uh, centrally guided, locally autonomous. Uh, well, that's a good phrase. Yeah. Uh, so local teams that have been empowered to basically lead themselves. Uh, around mm -hmm. a set of guidelines and resources and expectations. I, I think that seems to be the latest McKinsey speak. Uh, that okay. we just had. Uh, but I it makes sense that. to me. I mean, uh, to, to the, the last McKinsey session on healthcare basically focused on how a lot of the guidance on vaccines, which were the best ones, came at a global level, right? And we had global coordination and therefore they weren't repeating and reinventing the wheel. Uh, and that made a lot of sense. But of, of course you have to communicate that stuff. But the problem is that when you're dealing with COVID, the problems of rural India is very different from urban India, which is very different from North, South, East, West, every state's a bit different. And I suspect the same thing in Canada and everything else. So if you had a, a centralized team for that, they wouldn't necessarily understand uh, yeah. what needs to be done at that local level? Do you need to worry about oxygen first or do you need to worry about uh, making sure your staff arrive safely or do you need to worry more about medicine availability uh, exactly. or vaccines? So I think this, uh, if you empower your local teams, that seems to be uh, something that's a bit better. Uh, and the challenge, of course, with quality, and I think there's some fantastic examples. I think Jay Lakshmi is part of a, an integrated big system here uh, and maybe she can add something. She's one of our GC members, uh, is in, in the world of Covey Medical. Uh, I'm assuming that across their hospitals, they have some degree of centralization, but they have locally empowered quality leaders that perhaps lead. Is that fair, Jay Lakshmi? Oh, yeah, that's right. You're right. So, uh, I mean, that, that that's my 10 cents, but I, I don't know if you want to add anything else. What do you think? What do you like about being central and what do you hate about being decentralized? Uh, when you have it centralized, kind of you have the um, you have the power to handle it better. But when you decentralize, the efficiency gets better because specific jobs are done by the team. 
and it's easier also. So both has their plus and minus, I feel. Hmm. And I think we have also have Shobna here. I don't know if Shobna is around. She was part of the NHS service before uh, moving to India and joining us on our governing council. Uh, I think uh, that's the ultimate centralized system, if I would argue, in the healthcare domain. Yes. Hi, 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 everybody. I think which part of it, which aspect of it is like, you know, centralized and which aspect of it is decentralized. That's a big question. And as Jai Lakshmi said, I also second that, you know, they have their own pros and cons. Uh, like, you know, whether like, you know, see, for example, I've seen patients talking to me like I went to this branch of the hospital. Everything was smooth running, but I went to the other branch of the hospital. It wasn't running that smoothly. So like, you know, uh, I think they have their own pros and cons, but having a centralized thing is always better because like, you know, wherever you go, the same kind of care is what you need. And the processes and the systems which they have to follow should be the same. So I think I go by that. I think with the interest of time, I would first like to deeply thank you, Wendy. I think this was priceless. Uh, I hope we're able to have a dialogue and a conversation uh, as we build uh, uh, a little bit and invite you to one of our Kaho events in the future. Uh, and Wendy, this is our certificate of appreciation, which will be sent oh. to you by the team. Thank you very much. Your old friend, Carsten. So, and with that, we thank you all for staying the distance and please continue to stay safe. And if there's anything that Kaho can do for you, uh, please let us know. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Wendy.